That's funny. I'm pretty sure that's the shirt I had when I did the first video. Oh, hey, you're here. Well, welcome and welcome back to the channel. So I really do hope that you did enjoy the first story video that I published a few days ago. And if you did, I'm pretty sure that you will enjoy the one I have for you tonight. So we will be exploring the unsolved mystery of the Axe Murderer. Now this falls under the category mystery. What I do enjoy about the story is it actually reminds me of Jack the Ripper. First of all, because the cops uh, classified this case as unresolved. And, well, I would say lack of proof, evidence, and I think the main reason, above all, they never caught the killer. Therefore, if you enjoy the video, please make sure to give me a like so that this story could be pushed out to other people that do share the same interests as you. And if you haven't done it yet, do subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell so that you are made aware when my videos are actually being uploaded. Now let us explore the mysterious story of the axe murderer. New Orleans, the year 1918, and that was a year to remember because it was the year that someone was given the title or name you choose, the Axe Killer or the Axe Man. The only thing we know about this person is that he was very tall because each time he's been seen, people reported that it was a tall shadow and the weapon that he was carrying was an axe. He was also able to infiltrate people's home in a very strange way to a certain point where people started to think that he was a spirit. Now the interesting part is that we could not really say that this killer was made of flesh and blood like you and I. The reason is because people believe due to the fact that he was never caught, that he was not human. People believe that it was a spirit designed to kill. So we start off on May 23rd, 1918 in New Orleans. And this person named Joseph and his wife Catherine have been murdered in their own apartment located right on top of the grocery store. It is said that the killer acted in a very unexplained way. Uh, he did cut their throat and after once the victims were already dead, the killer decided to keep slashing them with his axe. So we can conclude as the good detectives that we are that this person was very violent because if you need to slash someone multiple times after they are dead you have issues of course the cops never caught the killer however just to tell you how this person was violent after he slid the throats uh, Catherine's wife actually her head was kind of not linked to the body anymore but when the cops did show up Joseph the husband was still alive well alive I would say between worlds, kind of, and uh, well, you know, he couldn't say much and he passed away a few minutes after. Of course, when that happened, people weren't like happy about it. Of course not. They, they were not like on party mode. There was definitely an investigation to figure out what happened. So the cops actually discovered that in the back of the house, there was a door and that was probably where the killer entered because the door was damaged. They also found some clothes covered in blood. So this is how it happened. The killer broke into the house from the back door, did the crime, and then he noticed that he was covered in blood, removed the clothes, left it there, and ran off. The cops also found the murder weapon, which was an axe covered in blood. Now there's no actual clues um, linking the victims. There's no logical motive that seemed to be connected together. So the interesting part is that the killer didn't steal anything from the house. So we could probably presume that the motive was personal. Maybe he did not like, or maybe he was angry at the couple, or maybe not. Perhaps he said to himself, oh, that couple, they would make pretty good victims. The only clue that the cops were able to retrieve was something that was written, and they said perhaps the killer wrote that. It was written with a piece of chalk, and it was actually the name of the wife. So Catherine will be sitting down tonight, and no one knows what the hell that means. So a few days later, we found the weapon that was used to kill Catherine and Joseph, the weapon that the killer used to slit the throats. This one was found in the garden of a neighbor. The razor blade belonged to Joseph's brother, whose name was Andrew. 
This was a special razor blade because it was used in a barber shop, a profession that Joseph's brother did. Of course, he became a suspect, but his alibi was that he went to a party and had fun all night. When he returned home to his house, which is next to his brother, he heard noise coming from his brother's home, but he was so, so drunk that he was not able to go and check. Of course, Andrew got arrested. However, he was released because we do have a witness that have seen a man and Andrew did not fit the description. Therefore, he was released. Now let's move forward in time. The date, June 27th. And I would say it would be around 5 a.m. when a baker named John was getting his things ready and he discovered two bodies still alive, Louis and his mistress, Harriet, who were laying in a bloodbath. So John, the baker, called the cops and they have discovered that the victims were attacked with an axe. So like the first murder, the aggressor entered the house via the back door. The cops also discovered the murder weapon, the axe. It was actually left there covered in blood. It was not hidden. It was right there in the bathroom. The cops also noticed that nothing was stolen, like the first crime scene. And they couldn't put together the reason, the motive, for this killing. When Ariad came back to her senses, remember, she was not dead. The two bodies were unconscious. So when she came back to her senses, she told the cops that the aggressor was very tall and he had dark skin. However, the cops didn't quite believe her because she was still in shock and she was talking about things that didn't really make any sense. And I think the cops were right not to believe her because after the incident, after the, uh, the two couples were healed, they went back to live in that house. And then Ariette changed her story. She now said that the aggressor didn't have dark skin anymore, but it was actually her man that attacked her. Louis did get arrested for this. He went to court and in front of the jury. However, the jury declared this uh, like nonsense. He was released because the jury said that it's impossible for someone to inflict that much damage to himself. The skull was open and they said no, no one could do that to themselves, so he is free to go. This story doesn't stick. Moving forward in time again, Madame Schneider woke up at night for some unknown reason and what she saw was a shadow. Of course, she was panicking and she started to scream. However, she did receive a blow on her head and then silence. So when Mr. Edward Schneider came home that night after work, I would say sometime around midnight, he did find his wife on the floor unconscious, covered in blood. She was wounded to the face and you could tell that the blow that she received was a pretty big blow because some of the teeth were actually missing. Yes, I did say unconscious because she wasn't dead. There was an investigation and they did not find any weapon like the other crime scene. So the conclusion was the aggressor took a lamp in the room to hit Madame Schneider and he hit her very hard to cause extreme damage. Or it was done with his axe and he took the axe with him. Luckily, Madame Schneider recovered and everything went well for her and the family. Let us move forward in time. We are now on August 10th it is the middle of the night and two young girls, two twins, hear some noise in the room next door. That room belonged to their uncle, Joseph Roman. The girls decide to go and have a look to see what is going on. When they enter the room, they see their uncle, pretty much injured, who received two blows to the head and the forehead was open in two different areas. The girls arrived in the room while the aggressor was still trying to flee. Therefore, they were able to see him just a little bit. He had dark skin, a hat that was falling just over his face to cover it. Sadly, the uncle Joseph died of his wounds. Like the other crime scenes, nothing was stolen and was reported stolen, and no motive was identified. Now, of course, at this point, the town is in panic mode, and they decide to do a manhunt to try and catch this killer. At the same time, a man, an old detective, speaks out, John D'Antonio, and he says that in 1911, a series of homicides were committed and had a lot of the same characteristic in what they see right now. John also adds that the killer of those homicides were never found. Therefore, there is a good chance that it might be the same killer. So that detective actually says that the, the killer might have double personalities. During the day, he's fine. He's perhaps a well-respected person and very sane. 
to the point that we could actually give him uh, our child to babysit during the day. However, during the night, he gets urges that he's unable to control, and those urges pushes him to kill. So facing this situation, people actually start imagining the axemen everywhere. So they go to the cops and rumor starts to make surface. However, the cops realize that the town, the people are actually going crazy over this and now they're stuck with false reports. Nevertheless, the killing actually stopped overnight. Less people were talking about it and people started to return to a normal life. It was as if the killer just vanished and everything went back the way it was. However, after a few weeks, a grocer heard some noise coming from the house next door. And what happened in the house resembled pretty much like a crime that the axeman would do. So the killer just indicated that the crimes were not over and that he was still in town. The grocer entered the house and found the mother Rosie, who was badly injured and she was holding in her arms her dead daughter. Behind her, laid the husband covered in blood. They were brought to the hospital where they have been taken care of. Now the cops thought that this was over and now they have to reopen the investigation. So this means that the killer didn't stop. The killer is not dead and the killer did not leave town. Unlike the other crimes, there was no clue left behind with the exception of the murder weapon. And also the back door was damaged. So the two main items found in the other crime scenes. So now the cops have no clue how to deal with this. They know that the person is well organized, crazy, and he has a passion for murder. So now the terror that was leaving is coming back because people are saying that the killer can now attack kids. So now we're back in the same type of terror that we left off. People think that they think that they saw the killer. Think that they think. But we do get a bit more detail, but not enough to solve the case. So. Uh, the mother Rosie, when she uh, recovers, says that the, the person that attacked her was actually the grocer with his son. So that story did not make sense to the cops because the grocer was over 60. He was actually 65 and he was not in shape and had health issues. So for him to be the murderer, that no, didn't make sense. And in regards to the son, well, the son was quite big, imposing, but maybe too imposing because there's no way he would fit where the killer fit. So to enter the room and exit the house, no way that this person could have done it. Now the weirdest thing happened. So the husband, who was actually still alive, so the husband of Rosie, spoke as well. And he said that whatever Rosie said, whatever she mentioned, was actually bullshit. So even if the husband spoke against Rosie's testimony, Grocer and his son were still arrested. The Grocer's son got a death sentence and had to be hung. And now the Grocer had a sentence of prison to life. And after that sentence was announced, the husband decided to divorce his wife, Rosie, because he said that he couldn't live with a person that was lying like this, and he didn't want to feel responsible for for the death of uh, the grocer's son and have someone sent to prison to life. However, the wife, Rosie, did acknowledge that she did a false testimony and that she lied just because she was jealous. Now that's screwed up. So the good thing is that all this was heard before the sentences have been action. Therefore, the grocer and his son have been released and no damage done at that level. So a few days have passed and a reporter suddenly receives a letter. A letter from what we think is from the axe murderer. And this is what the letter said. Esteem mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me for I am invisible. Even as the ether which surrounds your birth, I am not a human being but a spirit and a fell demon from the hottest hell. I am what your Orleans and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come again and claim other victims. I alone know who shall be. I shall leave no clue, except perhaps my bloody axe, dismeared with the blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rob me. Of course. I am a responsible spirit. I take no offense at the way in which they have conducted their investigation in the past. In fact, they have been so brutally stupid so as to assume not only me, his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to be aware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they never were born than for them to incur the wrath of the axeman. I don't think that there is any need for such warning. For I feel sure that your police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and I know who to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, your Orleanians think of me as the most horrible murderer, which I am. But I could be much worse if I want to. If I wished to, I could pay visit to your city every night. At will, I could 
tell you that this is a lovely letter. So lovely in fact that all the citizens were scared like crazy after it was published. Now there are a few people that tried to intimidate or you know what they invited the axe killer to their house saying that they didn't believe in that crap and that come let's go let's have a chat. That didn't happen. So let me tell you that that Tuesday night there were people all over the place playing jazz. It was the hell of a party everyone had fun and people were just going all out because they were so afraid that they were gonna get the axe. Well, the next morning, they did a, uh, a count and everyone was still there. The axe murderer did not kill anyone. So from that point on, we haven't heard anything about the axe man or the axe killer for about 10 months. And I do say about 10 months because something happened right after that. So what happened after the 10 months? A grocer named Steve woke up in the middle of the night in his house and he saw a very dark shadow right in front of him and he just received a blow to the head and passed out. That's all he remembers. Of course, I would have passed out as well. So when he wakes up, the only thing that he wants to do is get help. So the only thing he can do is run outside, goes to see his friend, which is just like a few houses away. And when he gets to his friend, he passes out again because he's injured. His friend takes care of him, calls the cops, the cops do get to the house, they investigate, and they couldn't find anything with the exception of the two regular items left by the Axeman. Yep, the back door broken into, and the axe. Now, of course, that leaves the town in panic mode again. So there's been a few more aggression or attempt murders. Yes, because some of them died, some of them didn't die. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, of those aggression or those attacks because it's about the same thing, right? Back door broken into, the axe weapon is left there. And either people are injured or they died. So we're going to skip to the last murder. So the last murder took place on October 27th, 1919. And one more time, another grocer was massacred in his bed. Now that night, his wife was not in the same room as he was. She was in the room next door sleeping with the kids. And all the noise that the Axeman did woke her up. She decided to go and have a look to see what was going on in the room. And when she entered the room, she saw her husband in the bed. The face was all messed up. There was blood everywhere. And when she looked up, she saw a dark shadow with an ax exiting through the window. Of course, when the cops got there, they did their investigation and nothing good came out of it. It was the same clues as before. The back door was open, the axe was left there with the blood, and even after speaking with the wife, there was nothing they could conclude out of it. So, after that, this was the last murder. Nothing happened. So the cops thought that perhaps that person, that killer, was either like a spirit, or got, I don't know, into an accident and died, and that was the end. So a bit like Jack the Ripper, this case was unresolved. They don't know who the killer is or what the motive was for the killing. So let me know in the comment section below your thoughts on this story. Let me know how well you enjoy the story as well. And I will see you in the next story.